In this uh, video, I'd like to uh, start talking about uh, the next part, part four, uh, which is in your textbook, the uh, classical period, which roughly, classical period in music roughly covers the time between 1715, 1750 to 1820. Now, when discussing the classical period, uh, it's interesting that this term was is being used for this these particular years because uh, a lot of you may be thinking, well, I thought what we were listening to wasn't that all classical music there. Uh, and they certainly didn't call it the classical period when it was going on in the 1750s, 1820s. They just thought it was just the modern or contemporary uh, time period of the time. But there's something about this time period that um, uh, we've... Uh, designated as being classic or uh, classical. And in order to kind of delve into that a little bit, I'd like you guys to kind of think about what does the word classic mean to you? Um, and uh, probably to help this discussion, and I'll post up uh, this uh, discussion forum, uh, what, are some, uh, what makes something classic to you? you know, when we think of classic movies or classic TV shows, you know, those genres haven't been around as long as classical music has been, yet we uh, we feel uh, inclined to uh, label things as being classic, classic movies, classic cars, even, uh, so forth. So um, what makes those things classic? I think there's a couple things that relate to music in that uh, w what we designate as being classic is that it contains qualities that make it extremely memorable, qualities that make it extremely memorable, regardless of the time, and that it will likely stand the test of time uh, one can never be so sure until that time has been, been passed, but hopefully we can, can kind of pinpoint some uh, uh, characteristics that make something that uh, will likely make it stand the test of time. So when listening to music of the classical period, think of what it is that makes it classic. Um, most people use it to mean any music that is not rock, jazz, folk, or pop music there. Um, I think one thing particularly about classical music is when something is deemed classic, it implies that it is a model of excellence that should be emulated and influential in, um, in works that follow it there. Um, and it wasn't actually used to, to describe the music until around the 1800s by these anti-romantic conservatives. Uh, among the classical composers that we'll be discussing or at least try to touch up on in this unit are uh, Joseph Haydn, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and Ludwig van Beethoven. Be Beethoven is kind of a bridge between the classical period and the romantic period, and we'll discuss him in a little bit more detail. This chart kind of shows a little bit of uh, some of the difference that you'll find in classical music uh, to Baroque music, at least generalizations. There's always going to be some uh, exceptions to these rules, but uh, where we saw in the Baroque, Baroque period where one piece usually represented one mood or affection, in classical music they tend to uh, fluctuate from that where the mood can fluctuate within one piece. Uh, as opposed to a steady tempo with uh, stress on continuity in Baroque music, um, like we heard in that uh, uh, Bach uh, fugue. Just kept going and going and going, whereas in the classical period you're going to have some unexpected pauses, changes, and even syncopations in the rhythm. Uh, the, the texture mainly for a lot of the instrumental music in the Baroque time period was uh, polyphonic, whereas in the classical uh, time period you'll find uh, the uh, instrumental music to be very homophonic, where there's a simple melody. That stands out over a chordal accompaniment, whether it be a block chord accompaniment or a broken chord accompaniment. I'm not sure how many of you were able to walk away from many of the Baroque musical examples that we listened to um, as being uh, very tuneful melodies there. Maybe the uh, Vivaldi Spring Concerto might be an exception there, but uh, often they were very complicated and not very tuneful, whereas uh, the classical music, you'll hear them, to be, you'll hear them as uh, being very tuneful and easy to remember, utilizing various motives. What I mean by motives uh, the definition of a motive is a short musical idea that's developed within the composition there. We 
we've heard motives being used in other music as well there, but that one particularly, that motive from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is probably one of the most uh, clear examples of uh, how motives can really define a piece just uh, uh, with uh, these really short musical ideas. And finally, uh, a couple other comparisons as far as uh, the characteristics of the music from between the Baroque and Classical period. Uh, the dynamics, there's going to be more use of uh, gradual dynamics such as crescendos and diminuendos, uh, whereas in the Baroque time period there's more of a use of terrace dynamics. And a lot of that had to deal with the uh, instrument of the time there. The harpsichord only can perform one dynamic level at a time, whereas in the classical era, the forte piano became the main keyboard instrument and where the dynamic level was uh, determined directly by the amount of finger pressure and velocity that the uh, uh, pianist uh, applied at the keyboard. You'll also note that the orchestra changes quite dramatically um, from the Baroque to the classical period. It didn't happen overnight there, but it seemed to evolve. Whereas the classical orchestra, um, there was uh, less use of the basso continuo because uh, a lot of the music had to be written for amateur musicians. Those didn't ha that didn't have a specialized training in um, uh, in playing uh, music uh, during the time. And composers also wanted more control over how the music was played out, whereas a basso continuo, a lot of times there was improvised accompaniment. Uh, the larger orchestra in the classical period um, was uh, as a result of um, composers wanting to expand the tone colors of the orchestra to include woodwinds, brass, and percussions as standard instruments and not just for special effects as it was used in the Baroque time period. And emphasizing a sp specific uniqueness on all those different instruments uh, that all were expanding the orchestra. As far as uh, some of the instrumental music, uh, the Baroque concertos usually had a, a formula of having a fast movement followed by a slow movement and then a fast movement. And then classical symphonies, string quartets, sonatas, and concertos expanded on that by including uh, a fast movement, a slow movement, but then also a dance-related movement such as a minuet, and then also a fast movement in, lar in these larger um, instrumental works. Baroque themes were usually centered around one main subject, but then classical themes usually had a vivid contrast where the movements could contain possibly two, three, or even four themes that you could conceivably hum or whistle um, uh, after listening to the piece. The uh, musical activity shifted from, um, from the uh, church or royal courts, which were the primary employers or patrons of music uh, in the Baroque time period. And then you see a sh stark contrast in uh, the classical period where Haydn still worked for a wealthy aristocratic family, one of the wealthiest families in Austria, the Esterhazys, and then Mo Mozart was a court musician but hated that uh, role of being a servant and tried to um, be a uh, successful freelance musician but of course uh, had some uh, uh, financial difficulties among some other <laughs> types of difficulties along the way in becoming successful, whereas uh, Beethoven uh, actually ended up being a successful independent musician in Vienna, uh, large, in large part because of the uh, downfall of Mozart. Um, uh, a lot of people uh, saw the tragedy of Mozart dying so early and uh, being unrecognized and uh, poor, and they didn't want that to happen to another great artist such as Beethoven. Don't forget to do the multiple choice quizzes that go in conjunction with uh, those chapters one through four. I also encourage you, uh, particularly the sonata form, which is not an easy concept to um, digest, uh, you might want to do some additional reading on the sonata form through these various web exercises that are uh, uh, posted on the online learning center to get a better sense of it here. And also the capstone activity, while it's not a required activity for you to do in this uh, chapter, um, uh, listening to Mozart Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor um, that is in a uh, sonata form. It's a great um, uh, online lis listening guide to get familiar with all the different how he uses those uh, main themes and then you can click all through it to uh, get a, a nice visual representation and oral uh, representation of how the music is organized in such a way that is indicative of this classical sonata form.